may be seated. You may be seated. I, I had an interesting, in my prayer time, um, I had this interesting vision from the Lord for you guys. It was the strangest thing. I was, uh, it was a couple nights ago, I think, and, it, and I w- we were in heaven. And if I let me get the details right, came around the corner and um, Jesus was kind of showing me around and there was Bishop Jakes, T.D. Jakes. Y'all know who Bishop T.D. Jakes? And in my vision that I saw, uh, and Bishop Jakes was chained to the ugliest woman I'd ever seen in my life. It's unbelievable. You know how dreams are and visions from heaven are. I was like, wow. And I remember turning to Jesus and saying, Jesus, <laughs> what's going on here? And he said, he said, well, you know, you didn't know this about Bishop Jakes, but Bishop Jakes had just a little bit of hidden sin in his life. I mean, he's in heaven, but uh, his punishment is now for all of eternity. He's chained to one of the ugliest women that ever lived. I said, man, that is that's tough. Jesus says, yeah. Came around the corner and there was Stephen Furtick. Same thing, chained to the most ugliest woman I've ever seen in my life. And I looked at Jesus, him too. He goes, yep, yeah, a little bit of sin. Punishment for all of eternity. And then I came around the corner and there was Pastor Caleb. <laughs> and he was chained, it wasn't his wife, it didn't make any sense, but he was chained to the most beautiful woman I had ever seen in my life. I said, Jesus, wait a minute. Now I get it, maybe Bishop Jakes, maybe Stephen Furry, they had a little bit of sin. But I know Caleb. I'm surely he had something. And she said, oh, no, no, no. See that woman? She had a little bit of sin in her life. And now for all of eternity. And for all you tenderhearted people, I asked his permission. All right, so. Some of y'all walking out right now. I ain't talking bad about my favorite pastor around here. I'll tell you one thing. <laughs> uh, turn to that person next to you and say, good medicine. That's what I've titled tonight, our time together. I've just been before the Lord and just really, just I'm so grateful to be able to bring um, a part of me to you. I think it may help you as much as God has done in me and so much more he's got left to do. But uh, before I go any further, can I just honor your pastors? I mean, can, I mean, I love the Howard so much. I love you guys. And uh, I wish the Lord wouldn't have me pastor. And I wish I was traveling the world. This would be my church. And I'd come here and, and I'd take communion. And I'd hear that deep voice saying. <laughs> Man, when he did that, I was like, whoo, Mufasa, say it again. I mean, <laughs> wow. I turned to my wife. I was like, did you feel that? She goes, I know, right? I got that little whiny sounding voice. When he talks, glory comes. It's unbelievable. Good medicine. Years ago, when I first, um, I went to Bible school and I graduated Bible school and the church that had been my church since I was a teenager uh, hired me on staff as the junior high pastor. And uh, well, just in a matter of a couple of years, I took the senior um, uh, youth pastor role, which meant I oversaw all the high schoolers and the junior high ministry. And, and uh, Jamie and I got married and we were in our early 20s and, and, uh, and our church ended up being one of the fastest growing churches in America in the 90s. And they would fly in from all over the nation to study us. And in fact, we had probably the, somewhere in the top three largest youth groups in America. Our kids were half black, half white kids, rich black kids, poor black kids, rich white kids, poor white, uh, white kids. Christian school kids, street kids, all the above. It was just phenomenal. People, could, they, they literally were studying us. Like, how do you get, you know, these kids to serve God like this? It was really something. And we were having miracle signs and wonders. But in the process of being the fastest growing church and one of the largest church, largest youth groups in America, um, <clears throat> we began to experience the systemization that you have to have to be able to handle that large a crowd. You think about a thousand high schoolers every Wednesday night in our youth group. I mean, we literally had to have the police. And we'd have 50 kids get saved every Wednesday night, but we'd also have three fights in the process. Somebody would lose a purse. I was like, don't go to the altar without bringing your purse, girls. I'm just telling you, it won't be there when you get back. And, uh, and that was just life. It wasn't even that they were bad kids or good kids. It's just kids, you know, just humans. And so, and, and so in the process of that, you know, we organizing. And, and I remember there was a couple years in there, we were just like, all of my meetings, all day long, what I'd signed up for ministry had turned somehow. And now what we were doing was handling the pressure and the stress of it all. And there were 22 pastors on staff. 
And uh, at one point, we had 50 PKs, pastor's kids, in our youth group. No, right there. I mean, Jesus, help me, Lord God. We had a Christian school, so all those little blessings were in our youth group. And I can remember the pressure as it mounted and mounted. And, you know, of course, young people break something every time. It's, you know, where there, is no, uh, where there is no ox, the stable is clean. And, um, and so there's always difficulty and hardship and, and this would happen. And so I stayed in the executive pastor's office. I stayed the guy in trouble. And we went to a small group based church and we developed ourselves as a small group based church there in the nineties and, uh, preparing for growth and for hostility. And, uh, and so I'll never forget one time around the table, our pastor looked around, he was under such pressure and that pressure came out on all of us. And, uh, and I'll forget, he looked around the table and he said, listen, if you don't double the amount of small groups you got in your area of ministry this year, we're going to fire you because one or two things are at play. Either you're lazy or you're not called. And either one means you don't fit on my team. We had bought the big radio station for the state of Louisiana. We bought the TV station. Our pastor was under such pressure. Uh, you know, the budget was daunting and trying to be sure that that comes in and pay for all the things that we were doing for God and pressure was just mounting. I'll never forget. I was in my mid twenties and quote successful, but something inside of me had died. I'll never forget, it kind of came out with one of my leaders one time when I was correcting this gentleman, this young man, and he looked at me, he said, Pastor Adam, do you love me? And I said, absolutely, that's why I'm bringing correction to you. He said, well, I spell love, T-I-M-E, and you hadn't spent any with me. All you've done is told me what I need to do better. All you, in fact, I feel like you look at me as a means to an end. And he was right. He was nothing more than a number so that I could build a bigger youth ministry because I needed to be successful so that I could keep my job so that I could prove that I was called by God. And that pressure began to be so daunting that something inside of me died. And not long thereafter, that night, I can remember I was just going through the motions, temptation flaring and all, all the signs all around me. And I love God, but uh, the pressure of caring for that many people and that type of life and that type of mega ministry at 19 to 25 years of age in those range in my early 20s. And now here I am married and we can't get pregnant and we're just, everything seems to not be working, but yet, I'm a success by way of certain measurements. And we heard about this little revival that was happening in Pensacola, Florida, or Brownsville. Brownsville Revival. And we thought, well, let's go. Everybody was going to it. It was only about five hours away from where we were at in Baton Rouge in Louisiana. So we took off. We took some leaders and stood out in line in the middle of the heat, like a day like today out there in Florida. Stood in line for five, six, seven hours they opened the doors and they had already let all the VIPs in from the side door. The whole floor was taken and only the last few rows of the balcony. We made it to the last row of the balcony and I am ticked. I am fired up. Do they know who I am? And they have made us, I mean, my little nose is all pink standing out there in the sun. I got these leaders, came to experience God. I'm mad, I'm angry. There's something inside of me. The, the life of God is dead inside of me. I'm just going through the motions. I'm just doing the job at this point. And as I'm sitting on that back row and they begin to worship, and I was like, ah, our worship's better than this. Then Steve Hill gets up there to preach. And I'm like, ah, we preach better than this. And I started asking around, how big is y'all's youth group? Oh, our youth group's bigger than this. And then they gave a call. Does anybody want to get prayed for? And the whole room, 2,500 people ran down to get prayed for. And they start laying hands on them. They start falling like bodies, hit the floor. I mean, they just started dropping. Boom. I'm like, I don't know if I believe in this. I don't know. And then uh, Jamie was like, come on, let's go get prayed for. I'm like, oh, you can get prayed for a bunch of bunch of devils in here and put us on the back row and no expected honor for us. And, and so if I mullied on down and I stood against the wall and, and they came running by, doom, 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 the fire. I mean, they were just all the stuff they did in the nineties, you know? And, uh, and so I'd already been through all that early on. So I was ready. All right, let's go. Come on. All right, we're ready. Let's go. Good luck. And I had been in multiple meetings. In fact, we had had some meetings at our church, which was a 6,000 seat sanctuary. And, uh, and, and, and I was standing in the balcony with all the young people. And this guy, you know, one of these Benny Hinn moves did like this and everybody fell. 3,000 people fell and I'm the only one left standing. <laughs> do -de -do -de -do -de -do. <laughs> like, I guess I'm the one with the devil. Anyway, I'm at that place. 
and I'm just miserable and I'm just standing against the wall and they're coming around and they're laying hands on people and they finally, they had this little, little guy and he just touched me like this and he said, more. And I don't remember, quite frankly, exactly what happened, but I do remember being conscien- conscious, but just being, <clears throat> well, before I was a Christian, our family got drunk a lot. And that's about all I know how to connect it to is that I'm on the floor, snot is coming out my nose, I'm laughing uncontrollably. And do you remember the, the little Tickle Me Elmo dolls? <laughs> That's what's happening to me. It's like God is tickling me the whole time. My wife tells me later that I laid on the floor laughing uncontrollably for three hours. I don't want to make a doctrine out of holy laughter, but I want to tell you something. In that moment, everything shifted for me. It shifted. For the first time in my life, I had gotten radically saved, fully in love with Jesus. I had learned to be carnal and overcome that. And then I learned what it was to be crushed by ministry and people's expectation and my own sinful nature and my own aggressive behavior to try to outdo everybody else in the world. And that just about destroyed me. And then I learned what it was to have the finger of God touch that place in my soul. And all of a sudden, everything made sense. A key scripture for you tonight comes straight out of Proverbs chapter 17, verse 22. A merry heart doeth good like a medicine, but a broken spirit dryeth the bones. A merry heart is good medicine. Everybody say good medicine. No, you can do better than that. Say good medicine. Turn to that person next to you and say good medicine. A merry heart is good medicine. But a broken spirit dry up the bone. I want you to know I had a broken spirit. My soul was aching and I didn't know what to do with it. I was doing everything right. I was reading my little Bible. I was trying to do all my little job like they had asked me to do. But something inside of me was broken. My spirit, my spirit man was broken. I was dry on the inside and I didn't know what it was. I didn't know how to fix it. But in the moment, God put his finger on that spot and laughter began to well up inside of me from the deep place in my soul. And I had a merry heart again, like I did when I first had gotten saved. A merry heart is good medicine. It did something to my soul. A merry heart is medicine for the soul is what this passage is saying. It's good for your soul. And some of you, you've had a dry, broken spirit as of late. Some of you don't even know what it is to enjoy Jesus to the place where it doesn't really matter. Some of you are so driven to be successful or just survive, that you've lost the merry heart. And I'm here today to teach you, like I had to learn, that a merry heart is the good medicine that we need. I need good medicine. I, I'm just telling you, you say, oh, pastor, I'm doing really good right now. Yep, but do you realize what we're going into, right? You're paying attention to what the signs of the seasons are, right? You thought the last election was bad. Don't go to Thanksgiving this year. <laughs> I mean, I mean you, better learn, you better get you a merry heart. I'm gonna just tell you that right now. Look what Proverbs 15, 15 says. All the days of the oppressed are wretched, but the cheerful heart has a continued feast. You know why I love your pastors? Because they're always laughing. They always got a good heart. Even when they're going through it, even when, when physically there is attacks against their body, they're still laughing and they're still enjoying the Lord. They know what it is to maintain a merry heart because a merry heart, literally a cheerful heart, is like a continued feast. How about Proverbs 15, 13? A happy heart makes the face cheerful, but heartache crushes the spirit. He said, oh, I got a happy heart, Pastor. I wish you'd tell your face that because the rest of us don't know. Some of y'all got that rest and butt face and it is miserable to have an engagement with you. It's, uh, I got some people on my team and I look at them and say, are you okay? Yeah, well, yes. Because you look like you're about, you know, about to you know, jump off a bridge or something. I mean, do you hate somebody in the room? No, I don't know what you're talking about. Well, tell your face that because your face does not know. A smile is about the least expensive thing you can ever do to give somebody a little bit of joy in their life. We all should walk around smiling because at the end of the day, heaven is our reward. At the end of the day, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords is our Savior, our God. And no matter what they do in this old government, no matter what they do in this old nation, we still win because at the end of the day, we will spend eternity wrapped in his loving arms. Are you with me today? Say yes. And so I'd like to just remind you 
that uh, laughter is good for you. And I, I'd like to just help you uh, kind of point out some of the practicals. The Mayo Clinic did some research on laughter. And guess what they figured out? They did years of research and they found out that laughter has a way to stimulate your organs. And one of the greatest gifts that laughter brings to your organs is it strengthens your heart. A merry heart is good medicine. It strengthens your heart. It literally, they have found laughter to do away with heart disease. People who are suffering and taking medication for heart disease, if they'll just start laughing again and they'll start enjoying life again, literally it causes the cardiovascular veins to open up, the blood vessels to begin to function better again as the blood flows and strengthens the heart. And that's something the Mayo Clinic also figured out, that, uh, that your T cells function better if you laugh often. You say, ah, you don't know my life. I don't have a whole lot to laugh about. I'll tell you, you've got a lot to be merry about. First off, let me just own this. Since it's July 4th week, you live in the United States of America. I'll tell you right now, thank you, Jesus. You live in this era. You could have lived in the 1800s. I don't know what y'all thinking about, but I like my air conditioning. I'm gonna tell you that right now. I'm telling you, ladies, can you imagine the big old hoop dress things, all the different layers and all that? Hold up, we're going to swim. Just give me a year to get all this off. And fellas, you'd be wearing wigs and stuff. Mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm. Thank you, Jesus. I live right now in these United States of America, and I can, you can take my gun away from it. Praise the Lord, we're out in Rockwall. I'm all right. All right, so, so let me just help you with a little bit of time that I got left. I want to give you some secrets to a happy heart. Write these down, they'll change your life. And I'm investing in you for the days and months to come. That's what I wanna do, I wanna invest in you for the days and months to come. For when you look up and say, what just happened to me? I want you to be reminded that a merry heart is good medicine for whatever you're going through. Here's the first secret I found over the years to keep and maintain that happy heart. And that, number one is that you gotta learn to find the good in the midst of the bad. You gotta learn to find the good in the midst of the bad. There's good in the midst of whatever horrific thing you're going through. He said, I don't see it. It's there. Keep looking. There is good. And in fact, James 1, 2 says it like this. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kind. It actually goes on to say that those trials are making you stronger. They're producing maturity in you. They're giving you strength. When you're going through those trials and difficulty, look for the goodness in it. There's some joy in the midst of all of that pain. You got to find. Look and find the good in the midst of the bad. And, and again, James 1, because consider pure joy. Now, can you imagine that? They're being persecuted, and James tells them, ha ha, go laugh about it. <laughs> laugh about it. Are you kidding me? The guy I voted for didn't get elected. They robbed him. I'm telling you right now, they robbed the guy I voted for. I'm so mad, don't you know? Listen, I'll get this junk all the time. Oh, Jesus, I love you. And pastor, I'll tell you right now, you know they got tunnels underneath the White House and they got these little children locked up in cages. They do, they got them locked up in cages. And you know those blimps that was coming? That was, that was China. They sucking up all of our secrets in some inflatable balloon because technology is not smart enough to keep the balloons from sucking up all our technology. <laughs> really? Mm, 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 mm. You're crazy is what the problem is. You need to get you a merry heart because <laughs> you all dry and pickly because of what you've been listening to, watching, and participating in, and you can't even laugh. Like, I get to laughing at them, and they're like, I'm leaving your church. I'm like, you need to leave because that's the stupidest thing I ever heard. <laughs> and I don't want you telling any of the young people and trying to get them to believe that mess. You've been watching way, you see, you, none of your grandkids have taught you how to, what websites not to look at. That's your problem. And just because it's on TikTok, don't make it real, all right? So you need to understand that. The Facebook is not telling you the truth, sir. I've learned to laugh about it because there's good even in the midst of the bad. They make you stronger. You know the old story. They did this research. They took these two little boys and they put them in rooms. First little boy, they put him in a room with every toy imaginable. Every toy imaginable. They watched him with cameras. At first he went in, he started looking at all the toys and, and he's playing with some of them and then after about an hour he was just sitting there in the middle of the room crying. There was so much toys he didn't know what to do. He just didn't like it. He was mad. I don't want to get out of here. On the other hand, they took the other little boy and they put him in a room full of manure. Horse manure all over the place. 
After about an hour, they come in. There's manure on the ceiling. There's manure all on the, all the walls, all over him. I ask him, what happened? He goes, well, with all this horse poop, there's got to be a pony in here somewhere. <laughs> there's good in the midst of your bad. You just got to keep throwing the poop till you find it. Because there's, there's something great in the middle of it. Listen, listen, I have learned. I'm telling you what it takes to get a merry heart. When the Lord asked me to plant a church, I was like, no. Why would you ask me that? And I've had to learn in the midst of what I thought was bad to look for the good. And it's been so many precious people that have changed my life. That I've been able to mentor and pastor and lead and love on. And they've blessed my family. There's good even in the midst of what you may be considered as really bad. Here's a second secret to a happy heart, and that is you need to let Jesus be Lord. And I just tell you, you know, I know it's not like, there's no one like this in this church, but my church is full of people who they love Jesus as a Savior, but they don't love him as the Lord. There's a moment in your walk with Christ where you have to determine, will you let him be Lord? You come to him, most of us come to him because we don't want to go to hell. You right, I want to be right. I want something, I want to be blessed. I want to be blessed. I want to have a blessed life. I want to live my best life now. Come to Jesus. But then what happens about a year into that, you're like, this sucks. <laughs> I didn't used to feel guilty about getting drunk at 4th of July. Now I feel guilty. And you have to come to a place on whether or not you're going to let him be the Lord of your life. A merry heart. If you want to develop a merry heart, you got to let Jesus be the Lord of your life. John 16 and 33, he said, I've told you these things, Jesus speaking, so that in me you may have peace. In this world you'll have trouble, but take heart. I've overcome the world. He's like, listen, you're going to have problems, but I'm God. If you let me be the Lord of your life, don't worry about it. I got it all taken care of. But if you keep trying to be the Lord of your life, you're going to live in misery. One of the pastors that I really love and watch a lot on TVs in the city in which I live, he was testifying a few years ago. He was really under stress, got one of the largest churches in America. And he said he went and sat down with a counselor. And as he was sitting with the counselor, he told the story. He said, he's telling the counselor, he said, listen, it's so tough being a mega church pastor. He says, so hard for me. He says, you know, I, I'm trying to get the people to listen to God and, and I can't get them all to serve God and I'm trying to get them sign up for stuff that'll help them make them stronger. And, and I tell you, I just, I can't get them all to listen, but you know, we're growing, we're trying to support this mission and it's a lot of pressure and stress and all of a sudden the counselor stood up. He said, he stood up and went, Jesus, I've been wanting to meet you this whole time of my life. The pastor went, what are you doing? He goes, Oh, I thought you must be Jesus because you think you're the Lord of everything and that all the problems are yours to carry. And the pastor said, it hit him. He went, well, I, I'm, in, I'm responsible. Why, it's my church. I have to be responsible for these people. <laughs> and the counselor told him, you big dummy. It ain't your church. It's Jesus's church. It ain't your wife. It's Jesus's daughter. It's not your kids, it's the Lord's kids. It's not your business, the business belongs to the Lord. If he's Lord of your life, then that makes you servant. If he's Lord, our problem is we Texans. <laughs> but tell me what to do, shoot. They keep it up, we gonna succeed, watch. We get our own government going, our own nation, right here we'll do business with Mexico and make millions, I'll tell you right now. We don't need nobody. Governor Abbott in a wheelchair, let's go. We can make this happen. That's we, we, nobody tells us what to do. And that's a problem with Christianity. And I'll tell you why. Because Jesus was not elected. You don't get to vote if he's king or not. God, the Father, determined that Jesus is king. And you either submit to him or you don't. Do you know how liberating it is and how easy it is to have a merry heart when Jesus is Lord? Ooh. Miss Jamie started acting bad. Let me tell you what I do. I go to Jesus, I say, your daughter got problems. I don't know what you want to do about that, but I mean, you brought her to me. I mean, I ain't do nothing. I just said, yes, Lord. That's it. I go all the time, I say, your church got some issues, Jesus. I need you to know about that. That church, your, your church, Hill City, got all kinds of devils. You got to get them out because I, I can't be handling it. That's your problem. It's so much easier to have a merry heart whenever you let Jesus be Lord. Because then you're not carrying burdens that you should have never been carrying. Because you're not God. You can't carry those burdens. Why are you worried about all these things that are happening all over the world? And in the, you, you not, you, 
put yourself on your knees and cry out to the Lord to do miracles. It is his responsibility to take care of you and your family. He said, if you serve me, if you'll seek first the kingdom and his righteousness, if you let me be the Lord of your life, I'll take care of everyone on your needs. I'll meet all, have you not seen the sparrows? How beautiful, I clothe them, I take care of them. You see what I do with the flowers and I provide for them and how beautiful ordained they are? Why would I not take care of you? Seek first my kingdom and I'll take care of everything that you're concerned about. I am the Lord, your God. That's what this, you talk, it's so easy to have a merry heart. I am sitting there, I'll never forget. It's so easy, man. I just walk in and look at this building. They need to fix them tiles. Like you're the pastor. Nah, that ain't my problem. That's the Lord's problem. We ain't got no money. Y'all don't tithe enough. I don't know what we're going to do about it, but y'all better ask the Lord for his help. It is so much easier to have a merry heart when you're not the Lord of your life. He is the Lord. And when you let Jesus be Lord, he, liber he literally will take care of all those things. It's so liberating. Here's the third secret to having a happy heart or a merry heart. And that is you need to redefine what is success in life. You need to redefine it. What is it? See, for me, success was having the largest youth ministry in America. Which meant I had to have more leaders than anybody else in America. Which meant I had to spend more time making leaders than anyone else in America is willing to do. And that literally drove me almost insane. Because I thought success was me being at the pinnacle where everyone called out my name and said, that guy right there, he is the youth expert in the United States of America. That's where I was at in the 90s. And literally, had God not sent me to the Brownsville Revival and had that little no-name little guy put his hand on my, on my forehead and had I not submitted to what the Lord was trying to do in that moment, I would have never been able to stand here before you today because there was so many trials and so much difficulty and so much hardship that I created because of my own desire to be worldly success. Whatever the world success status was, I just brought it over into Christianity. And you need to learn how to redefine what is success. And you're, how big of a business do you need? How many employees do you have to have? How, how, much, how, how, how much influence, how many, listen to me young adults, how much social influence do you really have to have? Because with every one of those extra things that you have to do to get all those things only adds more stress, worry, doubt, and unbelief to your life. And so you need to redefine it. And I can help you in defining what success should be in our lives. First Timothy chapter six, verse six through nine, but godliness with contentment is great gain. But godliness with contentment. Learning to be content in serving God. Lord, it doesn't matter if you give me a big house or a small house. Doesn't matter, Lord God, I'm, I'm going to serve you, I'm going to work hard, but I'm going to be content. I'm going to be content in whatever comes my way, by way of me serving God. Continues on. He says, because we brought nothing into the world and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. This is the Apostle Paul talking. He says, and those who want to get rich, have, get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. Can I tell you something? I had an uncle who was the youngest millionaire in Baton Rouge in the 80s. He made it big in oil industry. He had the big fancy house. He had all the European exotic cars. He would ship them over. He was brilliant. He would, he would, do, he would order you know, 15 exotic cars from Europe. Everything from Ferraris to Lambos to, you know, Porsche was a big deal in the 80s. And, and then he would order 15 and by uh, you know, selling those off to all his rich friends, he'd make enough on that deal to just get him one free. So he was always driving something. So he, every family reunion, every time he'd come over to my grandmother's house, this is my grandmother's baby brother, he was in something. And I can remember being that little poor trailer trash white kid. He was like, that's what I want to be like right there. That's what I'm going to be one day. And so when God called me into ministry, it was a real battle. Because um, I hadn't been in Texas. In Louisiana, the pastors are, are not rich. I, And so they didn't have airplanes in, in Louisiana. And, uh, and so, and so I, I, I just, I, I wanted to be that. But can I tell you something? My Uncle Bo, his kids hated him. What, what good is it, the scripture says, if you gain the whole world, yet forfeit your soul? His kids hated him. He went to church every Sunday. You know why he went to church? So he could network with other businessmen at the church. Because it was the big church downtown. The big Presbyterian church. He wasn't Presbyterian. He didn't even love God. Kept an adulterous affair his whole time he was married to my aunt. His kids hated him. All of his kids went into drugs. Wealthy, one of the wealthiest men you could ever meet. And nice as far as networking. And I was on that same path. 
Can I tell you what helps you have a merry heart? One of the key, redefine what success is. Content with the wife of your youth. Because that lie, that lie, oh man, I'm gonna get another guy. This guy don't treat me right. I'm gonna still be a Christian. Let me tell you something, sweetheart. It'll take you so long to train the next guy. Just stick with the guy you got now. I'm just telling you. <laughs> just stick with him. You just need a couple more breakthroughs, all right? Get one of those dog whistles or something. I don't know. But you're almost there. <laughs> Contentment. Is great gain in God. <laughs> you still there? Say yes. All right, let's go. I got to keep moving because you guys got some uh, in and out burgers. Here's number four. Here's the fourth thing I would teach you, <laughs> and that is speak life. Speak life. You want a merry heart? You want, you, want, you want life inside of you? Speak life. Speak life. I have learned to speak life even when I don't feel it. Proverbs 18, 21, life and death are in the power of the tongue. We quote that. I make our people quote that every Sunday. Every Sunday we have these transition moments between worship and tithes and offerings and things like that. And I have them stand up there. Quote, this passage, life and death is in the power of the tongue. And the reason why is because some of you are crushing your own destiny with the words that you speak. You speak such evil and such frustration. Don't call it for what it is. Call it for what it's going to be. You want to talk about, it's so much easier to sit in a business meeting when they're talking about it's going, it's going to die. We ain't got enough. It's so much easier to say, you know what, man? But what if? What if God did a miracle for us? What if? It's just so much easier to say, you know what? I believe in us. I know we don't have it all right. I know it doesn't always work out the way we should. And I know, yeah. But can I just tell you, if you speak life, it takes on life. Years ago, I had a couple of knotheads in my youth group. And I went to the pastor and asked him if I could kick him out of the church and he wouldn't let me. That's how bad these jokers were. Some of you, wait, y'all might be in here now. I'm sorry about that because they're all about 40 at this point. And, uh, and, uh, and so the pastor looked at me and goes, Adam, I believe in your ability to seek God until God changes their life. I said, I don't believe in my ability to seek God. This, this is a spawn of Satan. There's three of them. They've all been spawned from the pit of hell. I'm just telling you. I, I, there was a virgin birth from hell. That's where they came from. There was no such. These kids were wicked. I'm just telling you. These three boys, and they found each other. They had the same demons. And they found each other. They coagulated or something anyway. And so I, and so, and so and, and I was really struggling with it, and I came across this passage. Life and death is in the power of the tongue. And so I just made my mind up right then and there. They were not gonna drive me insane. I was not gonna lose my joy. I'm gonna keep fighting for a merry heart. I've learned what it is now to have one. So I decided I'm gonna change my tactic with them. And so every Wednesday night, I walk up to them. Come on, men of God. How y'all doing today? Men of God, men of God. And they look at me like, you know we ain't men of God. In fact, we were worshiping Satan in the car on the way over here. <laughs> you know, and so, you know, it's, I'm like, okay. And every day I call a man of God. Hey, man of God, won't you come help me move these chairs? Hey, man of God, oh, I'm so glad you came this Wednesday night. Hey, man of God, why do you come? <laughs> My mom makes me. That's okay. Hey, man of God, and I call him man of God, man of God, man of God. I call all three of these little devils men of God. I was speaking by faith what my eyes did not see. I did. I just kept speaking life. Do you know those boys left that youth group? You know, they grew out of youth group and whatever and went on with life. And, you know, they were a bunch of knotheads, even still in college or whatever they went and did. But about 10 or 15, about 10 years later, after they were out of high school, one of these kids hits me up, DMs me or something, hits me up, and he's now almost, you know, almost 30, 25, 27 range or something, whatever he was. He said, Pastor Adam, I wanted to reach out to you, I found you, and uh, I want you to know I'm a minister now. And he goes, I was in the clubs one night, and I was just at the end of everything. Girlfriend had broke up with me, been living this whole nasty, goofy life. He said, and I laid on that bed that night after being in the clubs, all the drugs I'd been doing. He said, I laid up, and I was just staring at the ceiling going, where's my life going? What am I doing? What, do I, what am I supposed to be? What is life all about? And he said, and all of a sudden, I heard you say, man of God. I kept, and it just all night long, man of God. You're a man of God. You're a man of God. He goes, and I got down on my knees and said, I don't know why Pastor Adam called me a man of God, but he must be right, and that's what I must do with my life. He said, I got right with the Lord. I repented. He said, and I, and I, and I, and I quit what I was doing. I went and signed up for Bible school, and now I'm serving at a church, and I'm one of the associate pastors at the church. So I just want to thank you. 
for believing in me when no one else believed in me. I didn't have the heart to write back and say, I didn't believe a flying flip in you. (laughs) I didn't have the heart to tell him that. (laughs) I believed in God able to work in you. And I spoke what God says about you, even though Satan had a grip on your heart. I was able to speak the truth of what you were going to be instead of actually what you were in that moment. Stop calling it for what it is right now. Start calling it into the destiny of God. It'll make your heart happy. You'll start laughing again and say, woo, he's gonna be awesome. Yeah, but right now he's in jail. Yep, but he's gonna get out. God's gonna do a work in him. He's awesome. You start speaking life and it liberates your heart. It keeps your heart from being all crusty and grumpy and life is so bad and every song you sing is, it's so bad, oh God, it's so bad. Thank you for helping me, it's so bad. My goodness, we need to start singing, you're so great. And no matter what happens around me, it's gonna end in greatness because my God is good and he loves me. He'll never leave me, he'll never forsake me, but it's hard to have a merry heart when your spirit's been crushed. So you gotta learn. To reestablish a merry heart, I had to learn to speak life. And this is my last piece to you, and that is, number five, write this down. You need to choose life. Excuse me, choose joy. Choose joy. Choose it. You have free will. God gave you free will. You know how I know? Because you came tonight. You didn't have to come. Nobody made you, so you don't know my mom and dad. No, you, you could have ran away. <laughs> but you chose life. I mean, no, choose joy. Choose joy. You can choose it. Do you realize you can sit right now and you can choose to either fold those arms and say, I I was expecting something different than that. (laughs) Or you can say, God, thank you. I'm going to enjoy this. I'm going to enjoy what you're doing in my life. Even though I don't have everything I wanted, I'm going to enjoy. You can choose joy. You have the ability to choose it. You have the ability to say, all right, I will. I'm going to choose. I, I, listen, I, I've got a father-in-law who's, who's been diagnosed with cancer recently. And I just keep telling him. Every day he comes, why well, is hey, so bad? And I say, oh, come on, miracle man. He said, yeah, I have survived the light. That's right. I make him choose joy because I don't do well standing next to people who have lost their joy. I don't do it because I start feeling it with them. And next thing you know, I'm mad about life. And so I just, I have to learn, I just start speaking it. And then I start telling him, you need to choose joy choose joy. About 10 years ago, there was this little video that went viral. This little mom and dad were playing a trick on their little, on their little son. I don't know if it was his birthday or if it was uh, Christmas or something. I'll never forget this. And I was like, we playing this tonight. And it's this great little video footage of this little boy and what he gets as a present. And what they were thinking that he would be like, I can't believe you got that for me. His attitude is totally different. Play that for him for just a second. I want to see what you can choose. Okay. Listen, you can choose joy. You can choose it. You can, you can make a decision that you're going to have joy even though you don't feel it. You can choose to develop a merry heart or you can continue to choose to listen to everything Fox News is saying. I can't believe Tucker got cut off. <laughs> or you can choose to have joy. You can choose it. You can make the choice. See, a lot of times people think that I am silly. I'm not silly, I'm strategic. I'm very driven. And so to keep from becoming what I was in the early 20s, I've determined I'm gonna protect a merry heart. I'm gonna have it. And I don't have to be the biggest name minister and I don't have to be liked by everybody. And if if that makes you think me being silly or something like that is immature to you, you can own that opinion all you want. But I will have joy. I will not have a sick spirit because let me tell you something. I have researched all these old grumpy old preachers that have been pastoring 40 and 50 years. And the majority of them are mad, frustrated. They don't have life anymore. Their congregation starts shrinking down. Because somewhere along the way, they lost their merry heart. 
merry heart is good medicine. Last year, Jamie and I's number one spiritual son and daughter, they'd been married for about two years, and Josiah and Katrina are their names, and they're precious. Josiah, he can't hear out of one ear, and uh, so, he, so you're talking to him, he goes, what? He doesn't really do He's about this tall, and uh, he's the greatest. He's, uh, when he was in Bible school, he'd, he'd ride the buses just so he could preach to people. He'd ride the city bus just so he could preach to people because they, they had nowhere to go. <laughs> he'd preach to them. And Katrina, she graduated from CFNI and then went to SAGU and finished a master's degree. She, she leads worship and stuff, and she's one of, our, one of our worship folks too, and she's kind of a backup gal at this stage, and she runs our finances, and, and Josiah oversees our small groups, and we were so happy that they got married. I've been telling them for three years that was the right move. And, and so we get married, and I think about two years into it, they're pregnant with their first child. We were so excited. The house was so excited. They're kind of like the, the little special couple in our, in our congregation, and everybody loves them. And she, uh, she got with a midwife. She wanted to go more natural, and they had a birthing center, and it was just down the road from the big hospital not so far from us and we get the call that she's laboring and so she goes to the birthing center and they're about 15 minutes at the birthing center and they get real nervous and so they pivot and they make an emergency run over to the hospital and they uh, the doctors put monitors on and they said we don't we don't hear the heartbeat anymore this baby's full nine months it's a little boy and uh so we rush over. I, Jamie and I rush over. They don't want anybody else there but us. So we look into her panic eyes for the next four or five hours. So they finally decide we need to go in. And they do a C-section. They take the baby. The baby's dead. And so they want to hold their baby, which they should. And you know... Jamie and I have walked through this multiple times with couples. It's really hard for someone like me because I'm so passionate for the Lord and I believe in the miracles of God. I've seen all of his miracles so active in my life. So they put the baby in my arms like, can we raise him from the dead? Fully, fully developed, perfect, perfect, little, little fat thing, perfect, little baby boy. They just can't believe it. They don't, no one... They can't identify I me. And the first thing is, what went wrong? What did we do? What happened? And so I counsel them. I said, you know, you're counsel about the grieving process of loss of a child. And I teach them that you should grieve because a lot of Christians don't grieve. They don't know how to grieve. So they end up crazy 10 years down the road because they never grieved the loss of their grandmother, their loss of their friend. So I'm teaching them how to grieve. And I taught them, I said, but when the grieving moment comes to an end, you bring it to an end. And you go on with your life. You always have grief for this loss, but you don't live in a grieving season. Because we weren't made to live in grief. Because our Jesus overcame. Take heart, for I've overcome the world. You'll have many trials, but take heart. And so they listened to me. They were very, they're very teachable. But boy, it was hard. They'd come over the house and just sit. I had to literally tell the church, hey, some of y'all are stupid, so don't walk up to them and try to give them some fake thing like God needed another angel. I'll punch you in the nose if you do that. The people are just, they don't mean to. They don't know what to say. So they try to come up with something and it's just makes it worse. So I had to coach the whole church. They're like, man, Pastor Adam's mean. I just wanted to protect this little couple, you know? baby and so we had a, a burial celebration of its short life in the womb and about two weeks ago was the one year it was the, the one year to the date anniversary I'm heading up to the church that Sunday morning I'm thinking oh it's the one year oh I'm thinking I bet she doesn't even come to church <sighs> I don't know what to do and I'm just praying Lord give them grace we open up worship and I look up and she's on the backup keyboard. That person had called in sick and Katrina's back there. 
She's playing the keyboard. She's smiling. And she's worshiping. And you can feel the joy of the Lord in the midst of her pain. She came down. I was like, I told her, I said, I'm so proud of you. She said, I chose joy. Because a merry heart is good medicine. And I refuse to live in brokenness. Some of you have a crushed spirit. Disappointment has happened in your life. It's no and or buts about it. We've all got something to sit around being upset about. But your spirit's going to dry up. You're going to be that old grumpy person that nobody wants to talk to. You can end up running off on your spouse. You're going to be that one teenager that always has to have a problem for attention. Because you're drying up on the inside. But a merry heart is good medicine. It's good medicine. Choose joy. Speak life. Speak the life of God. Surround yourself with letting Jesus be the Lord of your life. You're Lord. I'm not Lord. You are Lord. I put it on you, Jesus. I'm not carrying that. You guys are going into a building project. Thousands are going to come to your church. You're going to build. There's so many people. Rockwall is blowing up. But if you carry the stress of performing so they'll like you, you'll dry up. Merry heart is good medicine. You know why I like being with you guys? Because you smile. Don't lose your smile. It doesn't matter what you're going through. Good medicine. This is the heavenly medication. A merry heart. Would you stand with me quickly across the room? I might be called silly sometimes, but I choose to have a merry heart. I'll sit in a boardroom meeting where they're all wigging out about to lose their mind. And I'll say, hey, at least she didn't stab you. And they're all like, what? I'm like, there you go, there you go. Smile a little bit. It's all going to be okay. Because at the end of the day, we're going to spend eternity with him. So what? Maybe you didn't, maybe you didn't have the biggest business in Rockwall. But if your kids love God and your wife still loves you, I'd call that success. You can wake up every morning. You got a church family who loves God. You got pastors that are the real deal. Yeah, that's pretty good living. Take the pressure off yourself to try to perform. Remember how to enjoy life and enjoy Jesus. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to just close your eyes with me. Kind of create a safe place where you can talk to your God. That's why I get you to do it. Remember, I tell you all the time, because if you're as ADDDDD as I am, you just can't believe that all the guys on the band are shorter than Nick. That made me so happy. Well, most of them anyway. Thank you. Thank you, by the way, for being alive and you. So with your eyes closed for just a moment, have you lost joy? Has a portion of your heart, let's call it that, philosophically, your soul. Does it have atrophy? I'm asking you right now to let the Lord heal you. It took him three hours of tickling me on the floor to set me free. I was so embarrassed, snot everywhere. My wife was like, you were so stupid looking. It's like, thanks, babe. But I was never the same after that. A merry heart is good medicine. Here's the first thing I want you to do. Some of you have been carrying a burden. You've been trying to make that business successful, and you're grumpy, and you're mean. I want you to hand it over to Jesus right where you stand. Say, Lord, this is your business. Some of you have been trying to fix that marriage, and you, you, it seems like everything you're doing is going the wrong way. I want you to hand it over to Jesus. Let him be the Lord 
of your marriage. Then he'll whisper to you in the days to come, do this. Don't say that. <laughs> and you need to let him be Lord and say, okay, I won't do it. I won't say it. Some of you hadn't laughed in so long. Not really laughed. You've chuckled. But it's time to release all of that pressure to try to be successful. You're so busy trying to be successful that you're burning yourself out. And I'm asking you right now, redefine success. You're standing here on a Wednesday in a room full of people who love God. That's pretty successful. You got a roof over your head. You got food in your pantry. You're a success in God's eyes because you love him. And that's the only eyes that matter. Some of you, you, you have a habit. You always speak the negative. You never speak life. Yeah, but I know, but you need to understand. You call it being responsible. All these millennials, they're not responsible. Somebody's got to be responsible. No, what you've done is you've become critical and full of death in your inner parts. Life life to look at that young man look at that young co-worker and say you know what I was just as stupid as they were and I'm going to do my best to build them up I'm so grateful for the men who spoke life over me when I was an idiot spoke life over me I want you to start speaking life and here with your head bowed and your eye closed here's what I want you to ask the Lord say Lord I want a merry heart tell it to him say I want a merry heart Lord I want to marry, Lord, I want to be, I want, I want the joy of the Lord to be my strength. I want it to bubble up out of me everywhere I go. The people say about me, you know what? That is a nice dude. That lady right there, when she talks, it's like heaven is speaking into my, into my ears. I want to be, come on, tell the Lord, say, Lord, I want to have a merry heart. It is the only thing that will sustain in the difficulties. The Bible says it's the good medicine. He is Lord of our lives. Let him sustain you with a merry heart. Father, I pray right now. I thank you, Lord God, that this church, that Lakeshore Church, Lord God, will be full of so many men and women that have such a merry heart that people come into this congregation. Lord God, as, as, they, oh, as they're building out this building and these things are happening, that people will come and say, what is it about you guys? It's like there's life here. Let us be known as the people who have life because our hearts are so merry because we figured out the good medicine and we refuse to die in stress. We refuse to be overtaken. We refuse to have to take medication for mental illness because we've lost our way. In the name of Jesus, I speak a merry heart over you now. I speak the joy of the Lord to be your strength through trials and tribulations that you'll find the good in the midst of it all because it's making you stronger, all the difficulties. There's goodness in the middle of it. Wax on, wax off. You're learning something. You're being developed in some way. And Father, we just embrace that. And we say you're good. And Lord, I pray you teach us to laugh again. Lord, I pray some of these guys that have gotten so grumpy, tickle them through the night tonight. Show up in their bedroom, just start tickling them. Look at the baby, I don't know what's going on. I just, oh my goodness, oh my goodness. Lord, just get a hold to them like you got a hold to me. And you literally tickled all the stress right on out of me. It just made me, Lord God, realize what life was really all about. Loving you, pleasing you, enjoying the 85 years that the American average lifespan has to offer. Hmm. Thank you, Jesus. Now, would you keep your head bowed for just a moment? I want to do one more little part of loving on you for a second. If you're in this place today and you're not sure if you'd go to heaven if you died, I'd like to help you. Maybe you say, you know, Pastor, I, I used to serve God, but, you know, life happened. Maybe you call yourself separated from Jesus or divorced. Maybe you say, I've never been a Christian. I, you know, I... I you know, I've been hanging out with you guys for a little bit or maybe it's your first time with us and, and you talk about Jesus like he's real, like it's not religion or church. That's exactly right. Jesus is my best friend. And the Bible says it like this. If you'll confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God, that he'll forgive you and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. He tells us if you'll repent of your sins, which means turn from, change your mind. I don't want to live that way anymore. If you'll repent of your sins, he'll call you a son or a daughter. He'll embrace you. Eternity will be secure. 
So today, with every head bowed and every eye closed, I'd like to give a call for anyone who'd say, Pastor, you're talking to me right now. I, I don't think if I died, I'd go to heaven. Let's change that right now. The Bible doesn't say anything about you got to give money to the church to be forgiven. And say you got to crawl on your knees or light candles or start an orphanage. Confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and you shall be saved. That's what the scripture says. And so today, with every head bowed and every eye closed, I'd like to pray with you. I'd like to lead you in a prayer of, con- uh, uh, of repentance. I'd like to lead you in a prayer of confession of Jesus as your Lord and Savior. With no one looking around, every head is bowed, every eye is closed. We won't zoom in the cameras. I'm not going to call you forward. I'm not going to embarrass you. Right where you stand, I want to lead you in a prayer of giving yourself to the living God, making Jesus your Lord. With no one looking around, if you say, Pastor, that's me, it's time. I'm ready. I'm ready to repent of my sins. I'm tired of living this way. And I want to surrender myself to Jesus Christ and confess him as my Lord. If that's you, with no one looking around, would you just slip your hand up so I know who I'm praying with? Across from King. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay. I see you. A few more seconds. Don't worry about what everybody else is doing. Please, this is a moment. But please don't push him away. I don't want you to stand there and him say, why did you push me away? So many times I tried to grab a hold of your heart, but you kept pushing me away. This is your moment. Now is the day of salvation, the Bible says. Amen. Anyone else? Give you two more seconds. Okay, thank you, sir. Yes, yes, ma'am. Make sure I see it. Give you a couple more seconds. Okay. You can put your hands down now. I'm going to lead you in a prayer, a prayer of repentance. There's nothing magical about these words. What's supernatural is God sort of tugging at your heart. God got you here. And then you said, I want him. That's supernatural. Now we're going to seal it with a prayer of repentance, a prayer of confession. Jesus is our Lord and I'd like you to mean it from the depths of your heart in fact could I get everyone in the audience to repeat this prayer out loud alongside those who lifted their hand and those of you who lifted your hand I want you to mean it from the depths of your heart ready let's pray like this say Jesus come on we can do better Jesus today I admit that I'm a sinner and I recognize that I've sinned against you but here and now I repent of my sins I change my mind I turn away from it. I ask you now to be my Lord and my Savior. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Write my name in your book of life because I'm yours forever. Say it again, because I'm yours forever. In Jesus' name. Now keep your head bowed for just a moment. Father, I pray right now the peace of God would overtake those who threw up their hands and cried out to you. I pray they would have the joy. The Bible calls it the joy of our salvation. I pray they would sense that and feel that and know that you're with them. And Lord, in the days to come, in the days to come, if they sin, if they stumble, would you remind them they're not perfect, they're forgiven. There's a difference. And Lord, as they begin to grow and learn and and, and, and you transform them a little bit at a time, day by day, Lord, I pray that they would hold on to you deeply and never turn back. So I bless everyone who made a decision for you tonight and call them sons and daughters of the Most High God. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. I love you guys. Thank you so much, Nick. Close this out.